Hey, welcome back to Comic Book News. I'm your old pal Dan Shaheen. Today, you know, if you believe the news that you see on YouTube and read in the comic book press, the big news in the comic book industry is that the comic books are doomed. The industry is dying. Well, maybe that's true. Maybe it's just evolving. But one thing is for sure, the art form of comics is alive and well. And we're going to celebrate that today because I read a lot of good comics this week. Among them... Strange Adventures, number one. Superman Villains, number one. The Flash, 750. In our graphic novel section, we'll take a look at The Cowboy Wally Show, one of my all-time favorite indie blasts from the past. All this stuff, and a lot more on today's comic book news. Oh, hey. Oh, my ride's here. Just kidding. Hey, today on Comic Book News, we're going to talk about a lot of stuff. Um, but hey, first, we're going to talk about new comics. What did I read this week? Here We're here at the new comic shop in front of the new comic shelf, and we're going to take a look at the new comics I read. Strange Adventures number one, uh, by written by Tom King, uh, art by Mitch Gerads, the team that brought us uh, Miracle Man, but combined with Evan Doc Shaner. Um, this artwork explores two sides of uh, the, the story of like war heroes. Uh, somebody could be a war him hero in someone's eyes, but also maybe a war criminal in someone else's eyes. Uh, pretty interesting stuff, and we'll look at it in depth. Superman Villains, number one. I don't know why I keep buying these Bendis one-shots. Maybe it's the beautiful Brian Hitch covers. Maybe it's the top-notch selection of artists on the inside. Maybe it's the fact that I'm actually buying in a little bit to this whole Bendis uh, Superman revealing a secret identity thing. Uh, anyway, we'll talk about it. Flash 750, another one of these jumbo size prestige edition, uh, big number DC issues featuring a bunch of little stories and a bunch of different variant covers to make us buy tons and tons of these things. Well, I picked one. You're looking at the 1950s Gary Frank cover. And how can you not pick uh, a DC comic with a gorilla on the cover, especially Flash. Uh, like, you know, last week I forgot to pick up X-Men Fantastic Four number four, or number two, sorry. So uh, we'll take a quick peek at it I, because I really liked it and I think it's worth looking at. Uh, Batman number 90. I don't think it's much worth looking at, but uh, we'll take a quick peek and uh, a few more of my thoughts about Batman in the post-Tom King era. Um, we'll look at Grant, uh, the Cowboy Wally Show graphic novel like I talked about and, and, and I've got a couple surprises in our back issue section so hey wait a minute we're sitting here we're talking you know what we gotta do we gotta check out the Million Dollar Comics Camp oh wow here we are checking out the Million Dollar Comics Camp you know what you know how we do it on the show we read everything uh, in reverse order of favorites so we're gonna start with my least anticipated now this doesn't mean it was my least favorite just the one i was uh uh least anticipating reading uh, this one lived up to it batman number 90 um tinian and this whole does their dark design storyline it just feels it feels like he's trying to do his kind of a throwback to like the classic villains of uh, Gotham City, so we got stuff with Catwoman, Penguin, Joker, and Riddler all teaming up early in their career, and a bunch of nostalgia stuff where Catwoman's talking about how, oh, it was a simpler age back then, back when, you know, it wasn't all about killing, it was just about, like, robbing museums and stuff. And then we've got this dumb character, the designer, who I guess is supposed to be like a fashion design type idea and he's this the ultimate super planner thinker whatever what's a secret identity I don't, who knows um i did like the artwork in here i forgot that i forgot the dude's name offhand um but i thought it was it was fun looking batman art i'll i'll, I'll definitely have it in the um stuff below this video uh Anyways, it was serviceable. Actually, very good art-wise. The story is just a little bit corny and not my cup of tea, this designer thing. Kind of dumb. Feels really contrived. After coming off a heavy, like, interesting, emotional run like Tom King's to, to go into this kind of stuff is, I don't know, a little disappointing to me. 
Did like this art. That is a sinister looking Joker. I give him that. Anyway, not super stoked on that. Um, next, I was a little more uh, excited for, for Flash 750, I guess. Um, normally, I haven't really been loving these um, giant size ones. I thought I'd do this. I, you know, I did the Wonder Woman. I did the, the, the action comics, Batman. Anyway, I leafed through it, and I thought the art was worth looking at. But, man, I will say this. The story, crummy. Don't really like the convoluted idea of the Flash. Don't get me wrong. I like the idea of there being legacy heroes. I like the idea of there being Jay Garrick and and then um, uh, uh, Barry Allen and Wally West, etc. But like, I don't like them all being the Flash or a version of the Flash simultaneously. And they got a whole Flash family full of multiple kid Flashes and all kinds of stuff. It's just confusing. And then the Flash's powers went back to being so godlike. I loved after the crisis, and we'll talk about this in our back issue section. I loved post-crisis Wally West Flash because he was dramatically depowered. They realized that having a guy who could go at the speed, speed of light and travel through time and vibrate through walls is a little, uh, doesn't lead to a lot of drama and fun stories. And but over the years they've gone back and forth and they brought in this magical speed force thing and then had to extend it with the slow force and the still force and the whatever force or whatever. Didn't like it. Did like the Scott Collins art and this little uh, Captain Cold story in here. That was kind of okay. I like me a good Scott Collins flash story. Um, but it was varying levels of quality throughout. Didn't make me excited about the flash. Some cool art in this Mirror Master story. And a couple of cool artists. You know, stuff that was worth looking at. Uh, the, the, the Jay Garrick Flash stuff. Again, I like it. But, like, I, he, they, they need to separate their eras. And, and make the JSA be from the past. And not, like, have every single thing be completely ongoing. And all the characters interacting with each other all the time. Because it's just a muddled mess. Um, finally we get what has happened to Wally West in the post uh, what was it? not Identity Crisis that other stupid crisis that they did last year that got my worst miniseries of the year but by Tom King mind you and Gerard's um, Wally West was framed himself for murder or whatever the hell happened uh, and now somehow he's gotten into the, the Mobius chair and now is at the center of the whole multiverse and space time and crisis. And granted, the Flash has always always been dead center in that stuff. And we'll talk about that a little bit in our flashback issue section. But pfft, Flash 750, save your eight bucks because there was not really nothing worth eight bucks in here. Sorry to say, guys. What do we got next? Okay, Superman Villains. This one I felt a little bit better about. Uh, $5.99. Not cheap still, but a nice looking comic. Great cover by Brian Hitch. Classic rogues gallery of Superman going on here. Um, good stuff. And this is a, a mixed bag here. So this is written by Bendis, Matt Fraction, and Jody Hauser with art by a bunch of different people. Including some faves like Hitch, Cully Hamner I really like, Steve Lieber's cool, Jim Mahfood, that was unexpected. We'll take a look at that. Uh, the usual suspects here for color it's this stuff. Um, we'll start out with, and here's why one gripe, they don't tell you who drew which story in particular, so you either got to know your artists or, or try and piece it together. I am pretty darn sure this is Cully Hamner. I don't think that this is... Michael Gatos, but maybe I'm wrong. I could be wrong. Let me know in the comments if you know. But this is nice looking stuff. So this is bringing back the fact that they've brought back Superman's parents back into continuity again as a result of recent continuity shenanigans. Um, and, and and brought back the farm. But now Clark Kent has revealed his identity, so he's going to visit the parents and they're worried about security. And he tells them Batman's got him covered with some kind of bat. Do hickeys, the same stuff that he's got protecting the Batcave. And hardly anybody ever breaks in there. Uh, next, we've got the 
the Lois Lane stuff. This is the kind, of, the kind of cool stuff that's been going on in Action Comics, where basically Lex Luthor slipped Lois Lane info that the new owner of the Daily Planet um, is actually the head of the biggest criminal syndicate in um, Metropolis. So this is a huge conflict of interest for them. The, you know, they know this could destroy the Daily Planet if they do reveal it, but if they don't and someone else reveals it, it would destroy them anyway and ruin their integrity. So interesting stuff. And we're seeing... Now, what we're getting in here is a reaction to a lot of the stuff that I talked about and complained about, and a lot of people talked and complained about, about like why would Superman reveal his secret identity, right? And um, because it would be such a danger to everybody at work. But here they're revealing, they're like, dude, how could we feel any safer than having Superman sitting next to you at work? Well, that kind of makes sense, but what about when he's not there? So in here, the Firefly attacks or whatever, and he takes one look at Clark Kent taking his shirt off. And, uh, and and takes off. So that's sort of half of the story. But like, if he wasn't there, what would that mean? Would he be able to take them hostage and then use those lives against Clark Kent, those people that he cares about? Maybe. Maybe not. I mean, Superman cares about everybody. Next, I really like this. This had to be Matt Fraction. Uh, and I think Steve Lieber. Uh, Lex Luthor basically just getting voicemails of people laughing at him for not knowing that Clark Kent was Superman. He's pissed. It's funny. Um, next, we get a little story about the Toy Man and what his future is going to be, right? So this is a character, and he's gonna, it was sort of schmaltzy and corny. He was like, oh, Superman sort of used to lecture me, and I never realized how cool he was until now he revealed his secret identity. So now I want to be a better person. So he turns himself into jail, only to have somebody show up. The new head of Checkmate, I guess, which is going to be the new Checkmate Leviathan series or something that's coming out. And they recruit the toy man to be like, to build their toys. Okay, cool. Nice choice. Um, I don't know about this art style here, the, the, this stuff. This looks like Photoshop pictures of some kind. Or maybe it's not. Maybe it's just like met, done from photo refer reference and then retouched or something. But something about it that just doesn't feel like and it feels like cheating a little bit, but I don't know. What do I know? Um, more stuff from Steve Lieber, which was fun. Oh, this was kind of cool, too. I talked about recently there was an issue with Mongol who showed up and like beat the crap out of Superman in the last issue of, I think, Action. And I'm like, who cares about Mongol? What's Mongol? What do I care? And then we get this story. I didn't realize who drew it. At first, I'm like, who drew this one? And then I'm looking at the design on this dude back here and that kind of segmented costume look. That's got to be Brian Hitch. And right as I look at these faces, of course, this is Hitch's part. And it's cool. It basically talks about how Mongol, he's sitting here ranting and raving about how super, it makes no sense. Why would someone as powerful as Superman pretend to just be a human? I killed my father who killed his father. And I'm the most powerful Mongol of ever. We've killed each other in, in a long line of succession that way. And so what happens? But oh, shut up, old man. And uh, his son kills him. And his son is the new Mongol. So it is Mongol, but it's not Mongol. It's the new Mongol. Okay, cool. War. I don't know much about Mongol, but I want to research it. This whole idea of war world and survival of the fittest seems like a low rent dark side mixed with maybe apocalypse kind of, but I don't know. Um, I never really thought the character was that interesting, but I'm getting more interested. Next, uh, the little Supergirl piece here with this Supergirl metal virus, whatever happened to her, she's infected with the metal. It's dumb. I don't like it. I really didn't like that part. We got a little Jim Mahu, Mahfoud Bizarro strip. This is cool. Mahfoud is an indie artist. Uh, he's done all, well, what was he most famous for? I can't even think of it right now. Um, and then finally, we end with... Uh, Lois Lane basically given uh, Leone one last chance to make a comment. She says no comment. Doesn't even know what Lois is trying to say. Just tries to blow her off. And Lois drops the story and drops the bombshell uh, about Leone. And this is the new status quo in uh, Superman and Action Comics. I don't know. I like it. Drama at the... I, I, I am less interested in the Superman cosmic battles and fights and stuff 
and his son than I am like the working world of Superman and cr- how crime would work in a city like Metropolis. And Bendis is delivering that. And I'm not going to be a hater. I'm getting back on Team Bendis. I was falling off, but I'm, I'm going to get on. Le- Event Leviathan was still crap. Um, so let's move on to, to uh, the next one. I saved this for almost last because, man, it's this has got some top-notch talent going on in here in Marvel number one. Now, this is spearheaded by um, Alex Ross. He's doing a but. There's like th- several different books called Marvel, Marvel's X, and Marvel something else. We'll talk about in a second. Very confusing to know what's what. This one, Marvel, is the anthology book. Okay, and so it's a multiple short stories. It's framed by this nightmare sequence painted by Ross. What what I mean, the guy is a be- incredible painter. It's really beautiful. I've never really thought he was. The absolute greatest at telling like panel to panel storytelling necessarily, but man, he makes up for it with beautiful pictures like this, and is surprising me with some innovative kind of panel layouts and designs here. What the heck? Go for it, man. And then he, we get each of these couple short stories. This is Frank Espinosa, I believe he did a book called Roquetto for Image a while back, and he's got a real kind of loose, painterly, expressionistic style that you'll either hate or love. Um, but paradoxically, I guess I fall in the middle. It's okay. I don't. I, I don't mind a loose painted style. He's not my favorite. This story was all about Spider-Man's webbing, the chemical composition of his webs, and where he gets it. And it's a little bit silly, um, but fun. Uh, uh, okay, anyway, not my favorite story of the two uh, uh, of the book. But then we get into, man. Kurt Busiek writing, Steve Rude, artist and letterer. And look at those letters. Look at those big, chunky, hand-drawn letters. I'm assuming they're hand-drawn. They certainly look that way. This has the look of an old-school hand-drawn comic, and it's written that way. It's written in the style of Avengers from the 60s. This is like Stan and Jack would have done it. Uh, Very close. I mean, the Hulk is a lot more... He's not like a mindless brood. He's got intelligence. He sort of talks and... There's goofy stuff going on here. It's very Silver Age-ish in that way. They're fighting goofy hologram versions of themselves, I guess. And the Hulk's got a big his own army of Hulk Avengers from these holograms. And he tells the Hulk Avengers to disassemble. All right, cute gag. But man, Steve Rude is world class. These panels of Captain America in action... Man, this takes me right back to the Kirby Captain America stuff that as a kid, I didn't even know it was Jack Kirby. I just knew it was this Captain America story that had just Captain America doing amazing things. Him trapped alone in the Avengers mansion and a bunch of villains decide to attack because he's the weakest Avenger, but he proves them wrong. And this was like the flow and the motion of Captain America was so amazing and so like just dynamic and action fact. I packed. I'd never seen anything like it. What I was feeling, not knowing what I was feeling was the visceral energy of Jack Kirby drawing Captain America, okay? And Steve Rude cut his teeth on that and is amazing and is one of the few people who, who, who can pull that off. And But then with a polished line and style and ink work and, and lettering too, like nobody else. Steve Rude, mwah, top notch. I was lucky enough to have him at a signing at my store, Hijinks Comics, way back when. Early part of the century. Oof. And uh, he couldn't have been nicer. Super great guy. And so then we get a little here. Here's what I was talking about here. We get the Marvel's X, which I picked up number one of and I hated it. I don't like this. Didn't like the art. It's written by Alex Ross and Jim Kruger. These guys who did the whole Marvels and it's the whole Earth X and the whole... Uh, it's basically his universe. Alex, The Alex Ross universe. I'm not into it. I read the first issue of it. Meh. Didn't even review it. Now this we're reading here. Marvel, the anthology. These I'm looking forward to. The Marvel's snapshots. These are the ones curated by Kurt Busiek. And he's brought together, and as it says here, an amazing assemblage of talent to bring you a total of eight new and unusual viewpoints on Marvel history and Marvel heroes. Two per month for the next four months with new painted covers by Alex Ross. I'm in. I'll be checking them out. I'll be reviewing at least a couple of them. And uh, and you'll get to see them here on the Million Dollar Comics Cam. If you stick around, that is. 
Now, uh, let's talk about Adam Strange. Strange Adventures, number one. Okay. The conceit behind this is Tom King and his old partner in crime, Mitch Gerads, are drawing half of the book. The other half of the book is drawn by this guy, Evan Doc Shaner, who tells the story of when, 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 when Adam Strange, you know, he gets transported by the Zeta Bean to the planet Ryan, where he lives that where he lives his other life there and everything is like idyllic. You know, he's fighting this wonderful fight for justice and everything else. Meanwhile, back in the real in the real world, he's at a book signing at like Barnes and Nobles or whatever for his book, Strange Adventures. And people are showing up and loving him or whatever. And then we go back and forth, right? Between the real kind of mundane world of Adam Strange, the dude living on Earth, and... Uh, out of strange fighting this amazing war on Ryan. You know, pew pew. He's the classic spaceman with a jetpack and a laser gun. And this is, I think, the appeal of Adam Strange. He really appeals to a generation, I think the generation right before me, a little more than me. Certainly if you were dudes who were into like Flash Gordon and that kind of stuff, he is the was the sixties sort of, I guess, successor, maybe fifties successor, and um, survives to this day. Here we go in, in Strange Adventures. Anyway, one of his book signers comes in and is accusing him of all kinds of crazy stuff, war crimes, kind of alluding to something went on and ran. We know the truth uh, about the Picts, the, the, the alien race who he's fighting on ran. And so the, the, the story is exploring the difference between this, even like the way he talks. When, he, when he's on ran, he talks in this sort of like eloquent, elevated spaceman prose. And when he's on Earth, he's just like a dude. And so we go back and forth and we get to see the difference in perception between like maybe what happened on that world in that war, things happened during war, and like the reality now on Earth where he's getting accused of war crimes. Um, I love the Doc Shaner art, this creature stuff, the, 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 the color palette on it, the design, very Mobius looking. I think that's a perfect fit for Adam Strange. And then back to this, Gerard's is amazing with his realism, but stylized realism. Is that a thing? It is here. Wonderful to look at. Uh, the writing is, was interesting. So the dude who accused him of war crimes is, is, is killed and apparently with some kind of alien laser gun. So naturally Adam Strange is uh, under suspicion. And... That, that that's that's our setup basically for the issue and he's come here and he's like man i didn't do it everybody thinks i did it but i need you batman to prove i didn't do it and batman off camera they say like batman refused me said no i can't i can't help you i'm too close nobody will believe me because i've been your buddy for so long in the justice league and whatever but i'll find somebody maybe to help you um and so uh, we end with sort of a dramatic moment on Ran. He was rescuing his, trying to rescue his wife and family, and suddenly the Zeta beam wears off, and and he gets pulled back to Earth. Meanwhile, he's back here, and we gets he gets uh, somebody's here for him, and he gets to meet uh, the dude apparently who Matt, Batman called to help him, who y you would know by this goofy jacket is uh, what is he, Mister Terrific? Okay. So we're gonna we're going back to old school modern twists on old school characters. Pretty cool. I liked it. If you don't like Tom King, you didn't read this. You didn't pick it. You're not gonna pick this up anyway. If you're a Tom King hater, but if you liked him, especially if you like the stuff that he did on um, Mr. Miracle, uh, this is really in a similar vein. And I think you're gonna like it too. So uh, yeah, let's go. Let's talk about. Uh, back issues for just a second. Uh, today we're going to talk about, last time we talked about Flash 123 facsimile edition and how important that was in the founding of uh, the creation of the multiverse. This was the first DC comic with that notion of alternate universes and that earlier different versions of their characters existed in different realities. And this was like a big thing, obviously, because it has completely consumed the world of comics and, and and even cartoons 
uh, if you watch Rick and Morty or whatever, like the multiverse is a thing. And now this sprung up out of an old tradition of science fiction. This didn't what didn't originate in comics. It originated probably in science fiction serials and pulps and stuff that guys like Gardner Fox read. Um, uh, I just wanted to bring up, you know, we also Flash 750 that came out this week. And that's what led me to, to read something I picked up at my shop, uh, my local shop, Scruffy Nerd Herder in Eureka. Uh, it was what? Flash, Dollar Comics Flash number one from 1987. And, um, but wait a second, wait a minute. You can't see a logo here. Why would I show you this image when, heck, I could show you the real thing in the Million Dollar Comics scam? Oh, no transition, I forgot. Uh, so, Dollar Comics Flash. This was the first Flash comic I ever bought. I bought it off the stands. Um, when it came out, post crisis. Post crisis, pre crisis, Dan, little Danny didn't really read DC books. Crisis and post crisis is what brought me in. The, the the recreation of the Flash, the chance to jump on board on Superman in Man of Steel and the new new stuff. The the new Flash jumping on board with Wally West, Barry Allen, the classic Flash everybody knew about, died in a dramatic fashion in the Crisis, and he stayed dead, or he did for a while anyway, till they really blew it and undid that. Because by bringing up Wally West as the as the new Flash, classic costume, new guy way underpowered compared to previously like they took got rid of he could go i think as fast as maybe the speed of sound now which i felt is super fast of course enough to be amazingly superhuman and have amazing things but not be able to just vibrate and bullets pass through them and travel through time and universes and everything else uh this had the art of jackson butch geis and introduced us reintroduced this new universe to like Vandal Savage and a few other cool characters that came in this Flash series. This was a fun book to read. Um, I, it introduced the idea that the Flash, this Flash, Wally West had like a crazy high metabolism. It's written by Mike Barron, the classic writer. Um, he has a super high metabolism, so after he uses his speed, he gets really hungry and he has to eat a lot. This was a new switch on the Flash, trying to make him a little more grounded and a little more realistic. And it worked. You know, I also had the opportunity, uh, there was another um, facsimile edition this week of Mystery in Space, number 75, sort of classic Adam Strange adventure, but I had to go to The Flash because this is just right from my youth. This was a little time before me, but it is beautiful to look at. Um, and, you know, I've said it before, I'll say it again, I'm really a sucker for these facsimile editions. I, I, I love them a lot. Um, so anyway, now it's time for our graphic novel segment. I hope you like these new segments we've added here because uh, it takes work. These things don't just happen. Today we're going to talk about one of my, man, one of my all-time favorite graphic novels. Like I read, reread this all the time. And it's one of the earliest works of a guy who continued and just got better and better and better and is like a consummate professional in the comics illustration and animation industry kyle baker has done so much you know more recently if you want to look at his mainstream work you would have seen something like the truth for marvel comics where they reimagined the first captain america sort of like a tuskegee airmen sort of like experiments gone wrong uh was was interesting stuff for sure um more recently he did a plastic man series because he's really great at humorous funny stuff you'll see his style is very can be very expressive and cartoony Perfect for Plaz. Um, he did stuff uh, back for the Dick Tracy. He did the like Dick Tracy adaptation books. And just look at that style. It was like he draws like nobody else in comics. He does, He's not trying to be Neil Adams. He's not trying to be anybody but Kyle Baker. And and that's okay with me. I love him. Um, got really f uh, popular and broke once he came. Um, he did Cowboy Wally Show. was like his first book. He presented some strips to um, a, a publisher, um, and uh, and they asked for more, and he sort of fleshed it out into the Cowboy Wally show. But he first started in comics working at Marvel. He was an intern at Marvel Comics making photocopies and filing fan mail. Okay, Did all kinds of work, did little pieces here and there. F finally showed stuff to Doubleday, who liked the Cowboy Wally stuff. 
and let him write a book. And he did a graphic novel. This was way back, uh, what year? In, in, it was in the 80s anyway. Nobody did original graphic novels, especially this was non-super stuff. This is very tradition, uh, non-traditional stuff in Cowboy Wally show, as you'll see. And he went on to follow it up with Why I Hate Saturn, which he's much more well-known for and you might enjoy. Um, he talked about... Uh, um, he, he wrote Why I Hate Saturn at a time when comic books stopped being fun for him. He was tired of being told how to draw and what to draw. Sick of begging people to let him work the way he wanted. Editors told him his stuff was underground and alternative. And he decided if he was going to work in a creatively oppressive atmosphere and not even be allowed to own his own work, he might as well go to Hollywood and be oppressed for big money. So he went over... Uh, he did... Uh, uh, Why I Hate Saturn used it as a pitch to like pitch into Hollywood. And he got into animation. He did tons and tons of stuff. Guy's amazing. Um, I would also recommend um, picking up, if you can find it, look for something called Instant Piano. This was an anthology book of work he did with his buddies from way back when who end up being some of the great cartoonists around. It's Kyle Baker, Mark Badger, Robbie Bush, Stephen DeStefano, and Evan Dorkin. Evan Dorkin, one of my all-time favorites. We'll be talking about him a lot soon. Um, pick up Instant Piano if you can find it. But for now, uh, let's talk about Cow Cowboy Wally show uh, in the uh, where, where, where? In the Million Dollar Comics cam, right? In the graphic novel cam. So this is black and white. You gonna? It's uh, oversized, right? Here's a regular comic. Here's Cowboy Wally show. This is a format that Baker uh, likes drawing. How, how, how I, uh, Why I Hate Saturn is also in this format big and chunky i remember finding this book in a in a bookstore in emeryville california in like a borders book i just saw it never heard of it and looked at it and said this is amazing i opened it and laughed and that's one of my my it was in the humor section and that's one of my things i do with comic strip books if i take a comic strip book i will flip open to a random page and if i laugh at the comic strip then i'll buy the book i'll give it maybe one or two chances but if i don't laugh no then i don't so Cowboy Wally is, I don't, it's, it's like a mockumentary. So it's almost spinal tapish, following the career of our titular uh, character, Cowboy Wally. Okay. And he's sort of like old fashioned TV cow guy, cowboy guy, spokesman, like from the fifties. So a lot of weird corny stuff on his, on his TV show. And they talk about the legend and how he rose from the ranks and nothing to have his own TV show and eventually his own network and made movies and did so many other things. He's told in a lot of little vignettes and one page strips of things that happened on the show, just full of fun and funny cartooning and hilarious jokes and gags like as super funny puns, lots of puns and, and, Wordplay, visual humor is amazing. Um, as as we get into it, we'll see, you know, a bunch of his shows and entertainment shows and stri ideas like the Adventures of Rusty the Talking Dog that are I don't even want to describe them too much. I want you to seek this out and read it um, because he, you know he's the kind of character who there's the, there's a seedy sort of underbelly throughout the whole thing weirdo kitty show hosts with pre weird predilections for kids uh, and and just funny stuff. At one point, Cowboy Wally gets sent to prison uh, and, and they make a movie of Hamlet while in prison. Okay. Uh, well, first they make this movie of the uh, uh, Foreign Legion, American Foreign Legion and it's just funny. It's just joke after joke after joke that all land. Like, they're funny. The characters are funny. The dialogue is funny. And finally, the, the Hamlet. This is what I meant. I, I, I got ahead of myself there. He gets sent to prison, and they have to make a movie while in prison. Uh, and they pull it off with shadow puppets and smuggling a camera in and through some just amazing uh, visual gags like this here where we have this whole scene it's like it's the beginning it's act one scene one of hamlet told and you're reading and you're like where is this happening they've got all these characters and you know they're talking and because it's comics it's and the silhouettes are so good it's like you know this just reads like a comic so it reads like people but it's not until you realize 
you know, they're, they're little shadow puppets in front of the bars on the camera. I mean, that alone is not super hilarious, but it's executed so beautifully and so hilariously. Man, please seek out Cowboy Wally Show. Please seek out uh, the other works of Kyle Baker. You are not going to regret it. Um, speaking of not regretting things, man, I, I, I don't regret starting this channel. I have so much fun talking about comics with you people. Uh, especially in the comment section below. So if you haven't already, please take a moment and subscribe to this channel. Uh, hit like if you like this video. Hey, hit thumbs down if you didn't. But let me know why in the comments. Give me some discussion. Tell me if you like my format. Is this too long? Am I running off of the mouth too much? Am I rambling too much? Or, or is this what you want to hear? This is my innermost thoughts on comics straight off the dome. You know, I don't, I, I'm not doing a lot of pre-prep except to just read the comics and soak them in and, and enjoy them. And I've been doing that. I'm really stoked about the comics I've been reading the last couple of weeks. There was a real dip in quality for a while there, but it's springing back up again. I feel like, again, the comic industry goes through ups and downs, but the art form of comics has just been on a meteoric, meteoric rise. It's a hockey stick gra uh, graph of quality because... The artists of comic, they don't care about the shenanigans of the companies and the industries. They care about the art form and they're learning from each other and they're doing indie stuff and they're doing web comics and they're doing Kickstarters. It's not just about um, the big publishers and it never was, but now more than ever, it truly is not. So let's not worry too much about the health of comics, right? Comics are healthier and better than ever. How comics are going to be sold and where and when and what format? Well, those are questions for the future, and we'll answer those someday. And I hope you'll be along with me reading comics on the Trillion Dollar Comics Cam in the far distant future. Anyway, thanks for watching. Uh, we'll see you next time.